from Martin, Martin Goldberg Edwards. Can you please uh, introduce yourself? Ah, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm uh, a British person. I, um, I, I, I studied at the University of Manchester, where subsequently I was assistant professor. I did my first major piece of research in Athens in the 1980s on the employment situation then. Uh, I founded the Mediterranean Migration Observatory in 1999 in uh, Pandion University in Athens, uh, which unfortunately we closed for reasons I won't go into, uh, in 2014. Um, uh, the most relevant piece of research, I, well, there were two. Uh, the, the, one, the biggest one, I think, is 20, 2010 for the London School of Economics, financed by the Kuwait Foundation, where I did a big piece of research on everything we could find out, all the statistical data, all the realities we could find about the situation of migrants in the Gulf countries, the five Gulf countries. Prior to that, uh, in 2005, I did a fairly large piece of research in the United Nations on migration in the Mediterranean and, uh, and the Gulf. Um, I think that's all you need to know, really. <laughs> okay. uh, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, I'm uh, a Cypriot, uh, born in Cyprus, at least. <laughs> and, uh, um, I'm an executive director of a and local NGO called uh, KISA, Action for Equality, Support and Anti-Racism. My studies are in uh, social sciences. Um, I used to work uh, for several years in the field of, uh, with uh, young uh, people, um, and then uh, also with, uh, in the field of uh, um, domestic violence and protection of uh, survivors whatever you want to say it, of uh, domestic violence and since 2007 I'm uh, fully engaged in the organization as staff member and uh, we, we GISA is, 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 is based in, uh, in Cyprus especially we have our offices in Nicosia and we work on uh, with migrants, with refugees, uh, with uh, victims of trafficking, and we, we do um, we work on several levels. We we have uh, documentation and uh, awareness uh, work that we carry out, monitoring the situation in the country and uh, public consultation. So try to do advocacy work for improvement in, uh, of, of, for the rights of the people in the country. Uh, but also we have uh, free of charge services where people can come uh, and uh, get advice. Uh, we intervene for their rights. And at the same time, uh, we try from uh, especially important cases uh, when it comes to cases of strategic litigation to take cases to the court and try to use uh, court proceedings for uh, policy changes at the, at the same time. So this is more or less uh, who, I, who I am and the organization I work for. Thank you very much. So uh, let's continue with you, uh, Doros. Can you please tell us what is the situation and the state of the art of migrants and domestic workers right now? And we're talking about those uh, infamous or famous special categories of migrants and workers from abroad were there in Cyprus and we have now the COVID-19 situation. Uh, if you want, you can start with that, with what is their status right now with the COVID-19 situation. Well, uh, I, I will try to repeat the question or summarize it because there was interruption. I want to be sure that I understood you correctly. You asked me about the situation of domestic workers, but also in general of migrants in the country in relation also uh, or in, in light of the current situation uh, and the, and the uh, um, COVID uh, uh, epidemic. Is it correct? Yes. So, well, 
It's important to say a few words about the migration model that we follow in Cyprus in order to understand that we, we are eventually the only European country, member of the EU, uh, European Union, that has a, a, a policy that is more has more relation and similarities with the Middle East, Kefala system rather than uh, the, 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 the migration models and regime we are known uh, in, in, in the rest of, of the EU. It's, in, it's interesting because we will try to merge the community law with the Kefala system and actually uh, it's, we create some serious difficulties and complications when it comes to uh, the people to understand what is the situation in the country, what are their rights, how they can defend these rights, and so on. Um, Cyprus decided to put in place a migration regime, 1991, and the decision was, the whole philosophy of migration was on a, on, on a, a A4 paper, and more or less the idea was that we need migrants to work in areas where we cannot find at that time Cypriot. For this reason, they will come, they will be the, the last who can enter the company. It means that the, the, the employer must prove that there are no Cypriots available for this job. And then he will get a limited time permission to employ migrant with the obligation to uh, replace this migrant as soon as possible, Cypriot workers are available for this job. Not only this, but it's, uh, there is an active obligation of the employer to take measures, put measures for, uh, in, uh, in place to uh, improve the conditions so that uh, Cypriots will be uh, attracted by this job in order to replace the migrants. This is the whole idea of the migration model that exists until now. And of course, you can imagine that um, it doesn't work because we believe that we can replace, uh, a, 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 let's say, we, we reach a situation where the labor, uh, the, 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 the female workers in Cyprus the migrant workers, especially in the domestic sector, for example, they reach a percentage of something like 20% of the female labor force in the country. You can imagine that the idea was that we are going to replace every four years 20% of the labor force uh, in the labor market, which is, is, a, is it, it's, it's absurd. From any angle, you can take it. From the angle of uh, the economy, from the angle of, angle of the productivity and definitely from the angle of the protection of the human rights of these workers. Now, that, that is, this is how the system works. The, the, the migration uh, regime is not in the hands of the government. The government is administrating the migration system, but the migration system is in the hands of the agents and the employers. Those, they are the ones who recruit the people those they are the one who get paid to facilitate their entry to the country with whatever information they give them, and definitely they are not accurate, the information they get about the situation in the country and about their rights when they will arrive in the country. And of course, they have a very active interest to circulate the people because they get percentage, they get paid from the employer, and they get under the table paid from the employee uh, a serious amount of money. And they need to circulate these people because if you don't circulate one person, it means you get only once the fee for this uh, job. And because we, don't, we are a small market, you don't have so many jobs in, that they increase the numbers. The only way to increase your uh, uh, profit is to replace the people on the time uh, at the same at the same uh, jobs. This is how the whole system it works, and we reach a situation, to be honest, where we had um, a, a complete exclusion of the migrants in the society. 
So we have a, we have a society where migrants do not participate in any way in the society. We, they have a different discriminatory uh, health system until recently, so they were paying private health insurances, and these private health insurances did not cover, for example, a visit to the dentist, did, uh, didn't cover a visit to the gynecologist. Uh, uh, I mean, you can imagine the kind of uh, access to health care they were offered with these private health insurances. People work for several years in the country, but they don't have access to the welfare system. So they don't, third country nationals who work in the country with a temporary employment permit, they cannot apply for benefits, uh, for example, for, for, for uh, welfare or unemployment benefits, because from the moment they are unemployed, they lose their resident status and they cannot apply for unemployment benefits. So they are undocumented in the country. And, it's, and, and several other sectors where you have a real segregation, no, the, the people, they don't speak the language, they, they are not welcome in the society to speak about, I mean, the current situation. We need to take in consideration that the current government and the current minister, since the beginning of the year, is running a, a campaign of uh, demonizing more or less the migrants and refugees in the country. So refugees, they are portrayed as people who are affiliated to terrorism, to crime, to uh, um, uh, fundamentalism, and a uh, and lot of other aspects, but in a, in, in, in a very aggressive way that if you see what's going on now in the in the media and in the social media, more or less, the people are not only excluded in the in, in, in the everyday life, but they feel very uncomfortable, they feel very insecure because they are attacked on a daily basis verbally and sometimes also physically after this hostile climate was created in the society. The COVID found these people, and especially the domestic worker, completely uh, um, without support. So the plan set up by the government, there was no hint, there was no provision about the special situation of domestic workers. For example, the benefits they were, if you have a company and you terminate your, uh, because of COVID you had to terminate the activities of the company, you could have, the, the employees can benefit at least some for some money during, uh, during this period. Domestic workers were completely excluded from uh, these benefits. Domestic workers who were living in, they were locked and they were not allowed to leave the house for four or five months because the people were afraid that if they go out and they return back home, they will, uh, they, they, they will bring with them the, 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 the virus and then uh, it's going to be dangerous for them. Even if they didn't have vulnerable people in the family, they thought that it's better not to allow them to leave the house and they stay in the house for several months. If they were living out, they would tell them, don't come to the house for four or five months, but they were not getting their salaries because they didn't work. Let's forget the many undocumented migrants and many undocumented women who worked, who were not even able to move, because the only way, as you know, to move during this period, it was either for one very specific uh, activity to go shopping, or to go to the hospital, or for very uh, central once a day, or to work. But these people were not able to show a certificate because they were undocumented, they were not able to show any certificate that they have that they can go to work. And for this reason, the majority of them, they stayed without money, they stayed without jobs, and they stayed without any support of the government. To be honest, we had very difficult situations, very, very difficult situations. The only reason I believe the people managed to survive is because of the solidarity among them. 
the communities they created and they responded immediately to this situation and they organized among the communities solidarity activities. So they they collected the names of uh, the addresses of the people and they were bringing them food or other medicines or whatever in a way so that the people they will, they will manage to survive because they were completely excluded from any support from the government. In the contrary, and I will finish with it, we had another issue to, 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 to face during this period. The police took advantage, in my opinion, of this COVID uh, uh, situation and, that, and they showed a very aggressive attitude and behavior towards migrants. It was unbelievable. In the rest of the city, the patrol of, of, by the police it was done with normal police uh, forces. In the old city, where the migrants are concentrated, the police who made the patrols, it was the anti-terror unit, and we have several uh, uh, complaints by migrants that they were feeling that they were terrorized on the street, they were humiliated on the street, and they were attacked physically, some of them we reported already, uh, uh, we filed complaints about these people already to the to the uh, independent authority for the for complaints against the police about the situation. Sorry, I know I spoke a lot, but this is more or less to give a picture of already the very difficult situation, how it was nearly made impossible for the people to survive, but thank God that they, they developed their own solidarity and we are in a situation more or less that uh, uh, we hope that the society will slowly, slowly uh, start again and, and, and the people will be able to gain uh, again uh, uh, their own income to support themselves and their families back home. Thank you. Thank you, Doro, for your very thorough uh, reply. Uh, now I would like to go to Martin. You are listening to Meeting Points, ladies and gentlemen. And I would like to ask, let's take a bit of the origins, a bit of the beginning. Uh, what are the origins of the kafala or kefala system in the Middle East? When it started, what was the philosophy and how it evolved and what is now the situation in the region, starting from the Middle East with the Gulf, especially with countries severely hit by the COVID pandemic? The microphone is yours, Martin. Thank you. Um, well, the origins of the Kafala system in the Middle East and, and uh, all of the Arab countries have this, of course, uh, is heavily disputed. Uh, for some people, it's a traditional thing that the, uh, the foreigners in any Arabic region have to be sponsored by someone who is responsible for them. It's a sort of hospitality approach, according to this analysis. And uh, it, is, it simply felt that you cannot bring foreigners your, into your country and just leave them to their own devices to sort out their own problems. You should be responsible, someone should be responsible for them. And of course, this predates the existence of any effective state. So this is a social system in origin, which is designed to deal with uh, looking after foreigners. This is one argument. Another one is it comes from the, the, the earlier, very temporary labor migrations of the 1930s and 40s, and it was really formalized in the 1950s with the large oil discoveries, and the need rapidly to bring in a lot of mostly unskilled, some skilled people, to deal with oil exploitation. So it really was, in a sense, uh, a big economic decision that they could not exploit their oil. They started off in the 1950s with um, British and French oil companies and soon realized that they were going to be ripped off if they carried on with that. So they decided to take control of their own destinies and they needed to do it quickly. And the Kafala system seemed a logical way at that time to quickly bring in a lot of people and somehow keep them, in theory, they thought, uh, under some sort of control. Uh, well, we can now say that they are kept under far too much control in some respects and not under any control at all in other respects. And the, and the reason is, as uh, pointed out by my colleague, that the Kafala system interposes the employer or the sponsor between the immigrant and the state. The state becomes a marginal actor 
in its own country. This is very problematic uh, if you have anything other than very idealistic and very well-intentioned employers, which I'm afraid no country has such things. There are always people <laughs> who look to take advantages to make more profit by not obeying the law and maybe just feel like behaving badly. Uh, sexual abuse, for example, uh, particularly with domestic workers, is a very common problem. So basically, it's it's the the lack of role of the state on the one hand, but as soon as the employers make a complaint, at least historically, it's getting better in some Arabic countries, then the state will intervene with the police and the courts and treat them very very badly and ultimately imprison or deport them. So the kafala system is intrinsically an Arabic system, I can tell you one strange thing, which probably nobody knows. Uh, the, the Netherlands um, brought in such a system several years ago, and it uses this sponsorship uh, for highly skilled immigrants mostly. And they, they actually copied it from the United Arab Emirates, where they went to study it. So we have one weird European country which decided to copy the kafala. It's not exactly the same as the Arabic countries. Now, across the Arabic world, there are big differences between the kafala systems. Uh, they have uh, emerged in different ways. Uh, they, they all have the similar characteristics to that in Cyprus. Um, recently, Saudi Arabia announced in February, in fact, that it won't wish to abolish the kafala. I'm waiting to see what they're going to put in its place, but uh, they announced this. But the problem with the kafala system is, is that the state is not in control, even though it thinks it is. And what we've seen with the coronavirus is the state reacted, I think I can say in every Gulf country, rather rapidly, rather efficiently, in terms of protecting its own citizens. So the first case was in the United Arab Emirates at the end of January, which is a family from Wuhan in China. And uh, within a few days, uh, there was control of the flights, and, and uh, uh, later on in February, uh, and, and then in other countries, most of the transfer infections was from Iran, which is the the hub of coronavirus problems in the Middle East. So the the um, the response of all of these countries was quite similar to Greece, and I think Cyprus. Uh, it was to control flights, it was to uh, impose curfews at one point, uh, lockdowns. Uh, however, there is one thing which um, you could predict, which is this, that the people in every country who are required to carry on working or, or things to basically function, like electricity and telephones and basic services, are all the low-paid, exploited people anyway. And in the Gulf countries, these are all immigrants. So basically, the immigrants were forced to carry on working in essential sectors, uh, whilst the population was largely protected. So it's for this reason that the coronavirus has spread very aggressively across the immigrant communities and hardly gone anywhere in the citizenship community. Uh, so, for example, in Qatar, uh, which is uh, quite a small country, it has the uh, latest data around uh, you me uh, around 50,000 sorry around 80,000 cases of uh, virus but the death rate uh, which is the highest ratio in the world the population but the death rate is very very low because the immigrants are healthy mostly male and uh, they are surviving the coronavirus quite well for that reason uh, however, the, the spread of the disease in Qatar and the United Arab Emirates is very widespread because of the presence of labor camps, uh, many of these, which are outside the towns and they're in very cramped conditions, sometimes even without proper washing facilities and water. And uh, the coronavirus has really spread very rapidly. So the authorities have not managed they put some of these camps on lockdown. One of the biggest camps in Qatar, for example, was put on lockdown a long time ago. Uh, they, they've managed a few things to protect their country and their citizens, but they've completely destroyed any semblance of human rights that the migrants might have had, even under the Qatar system. Now, under the uh, Qatar system, I mean. Now, the, the government of Qatar uh, actually did something rather positive at the beginning. It announced that those who'd lost their jobs or were put on short-term working, would be paid uh, in the same way as citizens 
by their company, by law. Well, they abandoned that by May, <laughs> but they did start off with, 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 with that as the law. The other countries did not do so, but all are providing free health checks and free medical care for those detected with the coronavirus. Uh, they are also in the other countries, uh, Kuwait, uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, they are also requiring the employer to provide, if they dismiss people, to provide food and cost of or accommodation for everyone uh, until they find an alternative job or leave the country. So they, they have done some of the right things, but in fact, those provisions are not being observed because the government is not in control of private sector employers. So in theory, they, they made some attempts to protect the migrants. Uh, some of them are being protected, but a large majority of them is not being protected. In terms of leaving the country, uh, again, we see a failure of the system internationally. We see a failure of the home countries of the migrants to protect them. So India and Nepal and Pakistan and uh, Bangladesh, they refused to allow anyone to return home on the grounds that it would spread the coronavirus there. So they were caught, between, even say lots of jobs. So they were caught between the interests of their home country, which wished to exclude them, and the interests of the country they'd migrated to, which wished to keep them away, at least from the citizens of that country, and maybe not give them work as well. So they fell in between two governments, and many of them have been left without food. They are dependent upon charity. There is a lot of self-help, as in Cyprus, it seems. There is also a certain amount of charity from the host populations. Um, in one country, in Kuwait, there are reports of a lot of increasing racism, xenophobia, and uh, even increased suicide rates amongst the immigrant, uh, the situation is so bad. So they, they have failed largely because of the capital system. I, I, I think we can say this. I think they would have done a better job if there had not been a system in place. Um, okay, that gives a brief overview of it, I think. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much. Now let's move to some other questions. Uh, we have about uh, corruption. And we have about uh, access to justice. That was something we were communicating with George the previous days. And uh, actually, right yesterday, George, we had a case of, our, of two friends where uh, they failed for the sixth time to go back to their country because the intermediate embassy just uh, couldn't uh, facilitate. They went uh, six times to the airport and six times you know, with all the papers, and the sixth time they were sent back. So this COVID situation causes indeed a huge amount of limbo for uh, for many people so uh, we you mentioned about at some point it was mentioned about corruption so uh, it's an open question to both of you how does a uh, corruption work in this situation uh, I mean uh, we, we said about the middle men the middle period the middle persons who uh, there they are the middle people who bring those people and they get a commission there's also access to uh, the police maybe how does it work but can you please maybe we can start from uh, from Doros why not how does the corruption work from the beginning where a person wants to uh, wants to travel to Cyprus to work wants to migrate to Cyprus to work so it has to contact an agent and private authority until they come and the duration where they work what cases of corruption uh, have been detected I wonder if there was... Yeah, yes, yeah, there, Martin. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, well, I can tell you that the, the situation of uh, uh, corruption in, in the Gulf countries is caused by what, what is colloquially called free visas. They don't exist in law. What it is, is a sponsor decides to make money by bringing in lots of people and not giving them jobs, but pretends that he or she has jobs to, typically even companies are doing this. Uh, they trick the state into believing that they are giving employment. They, uh, they fool the state into thinking that everything is okay, but of course they are bringing immigrants into the country with no work or fake work. And uh, the immigrants then go looking for jobs. Now, the problem is that the immigrants are paying a big fee for all of this. Uh, they are without any security, they are technically illegal, uh, and they often prefer to do this 
because the confining conditions of the capitalist system are thought to be so negative, tying you to an employer that you can't, you can't escape, you can't do this if they don't pay you, it's very difficult to sort it out. So many migrants choose the corrupt process uh, and defy, d deny themselves their, their legal goods by going down that avenue. Now, with the coronavirus, these were the first people to be vulnerable because they have no legal status. Uh, and as my colleague mentioned, they, they cannot even prove sometimes, maybe they have some fake documents, maybe they can get away with it, but it's even difficult to go shopping in a lockdown or anything like this. Uh, so the corruption there is, is systematic, it's, or systemic rather, it's, uh, it's widespread and it's known it's been known for decades by the authorities. They don't have solutions. They don't like it. They try increasingly to prosecute some of the fake employers who do this, but they they haven't had much success. They basically focus on the migrants. They 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 decry them as as illegal immigrants and uh, deport them. Uh, so Kuwait, for example, at the beginning of the coronavirus, dealt with this. Uh, oh, there's a specific thing I should mention, that when illegal immigrants are detected in, uh, in the Gulf countries, they have to apply for an exit visa and pay. Uh, it, the, the whole thing is very controlled in this artificial way. So Kuwait decided that the best way of getting rid of uh, the illegal uh, foreigners was to give them uh, an amnesty of sorts, that they wouldn't be prosecuted, and also it released uh, quite a lot from, I think, about 28,000 uh, applied for this, at least quite a few from detention for illegal residents, and paid for their flights home. So, so Kuwait actually made a sensible attempt to deal with that at the beginning. Uh, the other countries have not done that, mainly because they couldn't. Uh, United Arab Emirates has got into big arguments with India and Pakistan threatening them with the future of labor agreements, that they, they'll have problems if they don't accept the return of their citizens. Uh, recently, about a month ago, uh, maybe less, um, India and Pakistan have started relaxing the return of their citizens. So it's, it's slowly getting sorted out, but, but basically uh, the corruption just made the kafala system worse. That, that's the answer to a version, I think, and it is widespread, uh, very, very widespread. I want to I want transfer to now to Doros, if you can hear us. Yes, you can. Yes. Doros, you can. Right, great. All right. Very well. Okay, uh, there are, the question is twofold for you. First of all, if you can tell us how does this uh, cycle of corruption work, which are the stages and how does it work from a moment a person uh, wants to apply to come to Cyprus with a middle person, with a middle man, and also what are the accusations because we see on social media or, and unfortunately sometimes by mainstream politicians that specifically NGOs, they are accused of being part of the corruption cycle. Uh, lawyers are being accused to be part of the corruption Cyprus and the cycle. And also your name specifically, and Gisa made an announcement in answer uh, to some accusations. You have been also been accused of being a part of the, of the problem specifically you and Gisa, and also that you are part of a corruptive of the system of corruption. So, by the way, please reply to those accusations so people know what they are and what have you been accused for. The microphone is yours. Well, I will start with the last one and try to make it very short, because the other is more important, the, 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 to speak about the corruption in the migration system. Uh, as I said, the, the current Minister of Interior, from the very beginning, he had two, uh, uh, he concentrated on two issues. First of all, to put the migrants and the refugees in this country in a light of, uh, let's say, uh, a criminality, uh, uh, that they are involved in, in, in crime, that they are uh, uh, a threat of our culture, a threat of our demography, that they are uh, just a tool that is sent to Cyprus, uh, I mean to connect them to the problem with the Cyprus problem, that the migrants and the refugees, they don't come for their own interest to Cyprus, but they are sent by Turkey to use them as an army against 
the, 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 in the conflict or uh, against the, 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 the Cypriot. I mean, you can imagine that these theories, so within this, this, this was one strand. The other strand was, of course, to attack NGOs who defended and who were critical and, and they had the ability to respond to these uh, accusations. Uh, and it was very simple. For us, for example, the minister said two times uh, in television without, um, I would say what we did afterwards about this. He said, for example, that uh, we are, uh, he's very much worried because we work with INAR, the, Euro the European network is the main network in Europe fight, uh, um, funded by the European Commission to fight racism in our in Europe and, uh, say, and 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 he said that uh, Kisa he's very he's very much worried because we work together with Ina and Ina is a it's a very uh, uh, he work, uh, Ina works very closely with the Muslim Brotherhood and because of this uh, we are more or less in the hands of uh, Erdogan because the Muslim Brotherhood are uh, supported and work uh, and work together with uh, with the Turkish government, which means that through uh, this uh, network uh, we are controlled more or less. He said it openly. He said that there are valid information about involvement of uh, Giza in money laundering, and there is uh, a clear, uh, uh, I mean, uh, information about uh, uh, and, and and serious. Uh, uh, concerns about involvement in terrorism. You can imagine, I mean, INA responded, February we sent a letter to the minister and asked him to uh, either support his statement or openly and publicly apologize for what he said. And until now, he's silent about uh, his accusations. From time to time, he comes up again with a similar accusation but he keeps silent. So I, I can tell you that the decision, at least from Kisa, and we are very, uh, we, we, we are going to take the case to to the courts of Cyprus because we are uh, an NGO that we work in full transparency. We have anything to do with any, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, activities outside the the the, the legality. Uh, we don't have any affiliation with any uh, fanatics, whether they are Orthodox or Muslims or whatever. This is uh, not, uh, and, and we are, we 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 are not going to allow anybody to uh, uh, put this uh, shadow on the on 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 us and on this organization. This is uh, this is the reality that we have when it comes to the accusation. Uh, Kisa works only without any sense, uh, support from the Cypriot government. For 10 years now, we don't have any funding from the Cypriot government. Our funding comes mainly from participation in European programs with other, uh, with other civil society organizations. Uh, our accounts are audited by external audit, uh, auditors every year. Is there? They are on the on the website. Uh, I mean, published, and we are not going to. We are going to defend uh, uh, this organization and the work we do, and we are not uh, not to allow anybody to. Um, um, I mean, to use this uh, propaganda uh, in order to uh, either. Um, threats are or make us afraid and not be uh, uh, so critical to the policies or to the uh, migration practices followed now. But corruption is a serious, is a serious uh, uh, issue in this country. Uh, I mean, Cyprus is for the last year, every uh, at least a month, in one international uh, 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 media, either uh, 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 reports, international reports, about the serious uh, problems we have with uh, uh, um, uh, 
corruption in relation, for example, to the so-called golden visas. We have the, the so-called free visas as well in Cyprus, but this is not the main corruption area in Cyprus, to be honest. So we speak here about a big trade of European passports. We have nearly any dictator around the world, the world, we offer Cypriot passport. I mean, people who are now uh, chief of police of, uh, uh, of dictatorship, uh, people who are wanted uh, by their countries for serious uh, uh, main uh, economic crimes, uh, royal families uh, from, from that they are uh, princes who are involved in uh, human rights violations. We have all kind of people of these people that they are. They have open doors in this country, uh, with of course. Uh, 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 considerable, I mean, billions, some billions, uh, Cyprus, uh, the Cyprus government announced that they earn from this uh, sale of Cypriot passport. Um, and of course, we have, we need to see how the, the migration system, it was built in Cyprus. Can you imagine that in the 90s, nobody knew how to manage uh, migration in Cyprus. There were only two uh, categories of people and uh, occupations who are already involved in this. One was the owners of cabarets, because these were the only operating structures before 91 who used to know how to recruit migrant women to work in the sex industry in Cyprus. So the, the owners of the cabarets, it was one category, and the other category was migration officers. So these were the two categories who then became active and they built the structure of this uh, Kefala system in Cyprus in the 90s, how to recruit and manage migrants in this country. And to be honest, we, uh, uh, we had very serious uh, problems there, as, a, as, as it was said for, by my colleague before, uh, if a woman complained, a domestic worker in the past complained about sexual harassment or even rape, the police at that time, at the beginning, was calling the employer, asking him if it's true or not. And of course, the employer said, this is a, a lie. And uh, the result was that these migrant women uh, were uh, yeah, directly brought to the airport and uh, were deported back to their country because they complained about uh, they are uh, they, they, they are uh, uh, about gender-based violence. So the, this was how the system was built, and we still have a lot of corruption because right now these people they inform migrants in their countries. For example, we have thousands of students who come in this country with the impression that they are going to find um, an open society with a lot of job opportunities, even with the uh, possibility in one year to transfer from a Cypriot college to UK or to the States and continue their studies there. I mean, these are the, 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 the promises they give to the people uh, and they attract them to come in this country. Some of them, they pay for a so-called free visa, 14,000 euro. 10,000 euro, the minimum is 7,000 euro, but we had up to 15,000 euro. They, we have students who pay between four and 8,000 euro to come to study in a, in a so-called university, private university in Cyprus, and when they arrive, they realize that this university and this study doesn't even exist, and this is, these people then, they are so vulnerable that they become again in the, the, the target of these uh, uh, exploitation uh, rings because they need to be given new solutions. They cannot stay, they cannot return back with what they already pay, but they don't have a solution on how to deal with the reality. And it's here where you have the new exploitation rings who offer them, for example, uh, an attractive 
marriage of convenience with a European citizen or to pay a visa and uh, get them under the asylum procedure with the promise that they are going to facilitate then their entry to Europe. All these corruption mechanisms exist. We have evidence. We inform regularly the police about this. We ask the police to form a, a, a common committee to deal with this situation. But to be honest, our state is more interested on keeping these people vulnerable because we all benefit from this situation. The employers benefit from this situation, the agents benefit from this situation, the lawyers benefit from this situation, and this is why we are not very much, and we don't show the will and the political will to change this situation. We can do it, but the, the, there is not enough will to do it. Before we go to the follow-up question, I would like to say, Doro, that you make me slightly sad and embarrassed. That's the one thing. Uh, the second thing I would like to ask Martin, uh, do you have any comment on the, what has just been said or have you experienced from your side or personally or from your colleagues in NGOs any of this kind of uh, chaotic harassment situation? Uh, the microphone is yours, Martin. Um. I, I'm not working currently with many people uh, involved with the, the Gulf countries. I, I must admit, I am, I've not been very well informed on Cyprus, and I feel rather ashamed as I'm in uh, another Greek-speaking country. I didn't know these details, so I'm very grateful to have heard them. Um, I think the situation uh, generally with the coronavirus and immigrants has been that it, 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 it exaggerated. It increased all the inequalities. It made things worse, and I was initially optimistic that because it made things visibly worse, there would possibly be a, a, a chance of correcting things, of having a, a legitimate debate about it. In the case of the Gulf countries, this is not true, because they are actually in an economic crisis caused by the collapse of demand for oil. Uh, the whole situation is very unstable. Uh, for example, in, in the Gulf countries, it, sorry, in the, in the uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, estimates that up to 70% of private sector businesses may go bankrupt because of the coronavirus. Uh, so they are, they are facing an economic crisis which is going to be far worse than anything they've ever faced. And the immigrants know this and many are staying there in very bad conditions, even given the opportunity to go home, risking the coronavirus, risking being unemployed, risking not having food, because they fear that if they go back home, they will not be able to support their families. Because the, so the, the, the extent of remittances in the global economy is going to be very badly damaged in the future. Uh, so the knock-on effects for third world countries uh, are very serious. The knock-on effects for human rights, I think, are going to be serious. And I don't wish to be so miserable, but I'll say it. I don't see anything good coming out of this at all, <laughs> but I hope I'm wrong. Those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we go now, we're supposed to be our final question, but maybe we have time for more. Uh, we have been wondering with George, uh, because there is this kind of a, in Cyprus and abroad, in our region, this discourse war about the migrants, about uh, the domestic workers, they are like this, they are like that. And the discourse, wars, ex the discourse war extends to uh, accusations and uh, some declarations by the ministers, uh, in our case in Cyprus, of uh, Mr. Nouris to yes, Kisa and Doros. But the, the big question is that is what are the gains of those accusations? accusations. Or the political gains, if, if there are such political gains, what kind of gains uh, is this a discourse war and accusations? What that, for example, the Minister of, uh, of, uh, of Interior uh, gains from accusing uh, Giza and Yudoro? What are the gains? Well, you know, I, I, I think, first of all, uh, I think you should not feel at all. Uh, it's not easy in a country that it was seen as a, a, a small paradise for people who come from outside uh, and they come to something like 4 million every year in this country uh, to see this 
hidden realities. Believe me, even Cypriots, the vast majority of the Cypriots who live on a daily basis in this country, they, and you are aware of this, I think it's not well completely different than in, in the Middle East, they are not aware of the realities of these people. These people, the migrants and the domestic workers, they live in their own world and they are excluded. You know, when the media speak in this country about domestic workers, you will never hear the voice of those we speak about. There is no such a thing. This is a serious problem because we, 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 the, the, the migrants, they, they are not visible. They don't have a voice. They don't have rights. They, don't, it, they are there to, to offer their labor force if they are lucky, have a good labor relation with, her, with, with their employer and get paid for their work? Not, definitely not, according to the serious contribution in this country, much less, but they are lucky if they get paid at all. This is the reality that we have in this country, and this is why I believe that we know we got used to it now. It runs like this for the last 30 years. It's very difficult now. We need a visionary politicians. We need people who can come and say, let's rethink this whole concept because it doesn't work. Because we created a society that there are two or three categories, two or three levels, people with uh, less rights, people with less dignity, people with less whatever, uh, um, uh, because of their nationality, because of their status, because of their color. We cannot continue as a European country, in my opinion, as any civilized country, and not just the European or not, uh, to, to treat people in this way. I think we need to find the, the possibility to put this on the agenda and say, we need to decide to build again a migration regime that enables the people to come and work and stay in this country and offer their qualifications because this is migrants they have a lot more they can give to the society if they are given a chance but they don't they are not even given the chance to do it they are not allowed to work more than in one employer let's say but what is what is this they they they, they cannot they they want to do uh, work and, and, and economic activities, and they are prohibited. I mean, it's against the basic principle of this world, of, of this uh, 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 the development of this of this world, such a, an, an approach. But this is a reality, and I think the problem we have right now, what, what you said, is that on one hand, we have to defend a very difficult situation because it's true that the governments. I don't know, in some countries, for example, in Europe, they offer regularization during this process. They treated the people irrespective of their status equally and well. We had the opposite direction. So we had a situation where it's a situation where nobody wanted to speak about the migrants, that they also have needs because of the coronavirus. They were, well, everybody was thinking that no, no, now we have to concentrate uh, to, uh, only on, on our people. But who are our people at the end of the day? Why there are our and their people in a society where we all live together? This is something that we experience in this period of law. At the same time, to defend these rights, but also to ask the people that we need to bring changes is a difficult situation. And I am also pessimistic, to be honest, that is we don't have currently much space for these needed changes. They are so much needed for the whole society, but I'm not so optimistic that our politicians, the policy makers, the decision makers, they are interested to take, and I will come with this, why they do this, why they play this game? What do they gain out of this? Yeah. It's a catch-22 game. It's a catch-22 situation, I believe. These people, they are not able to deal with the problems because the problems are there. The populists, they exaggerate these problems. The neo-Nazis and the far-right, 
they are using these problems for their propaganda and then instead of dealing with this problem the problem comes and becomes so big that the politicians the only reaction they have to this is you are right and we are going to make the situation worse but once you say you are right we are going to be to make the situation worse to justify your policies you want to implement to restrict the rights of the people you put you get into a new circle of increasing of the, the violence in one new circle of increasing the hostility and it's a matter of time that you will reach a situation where the measures you already took that are not more enough and you have to take new measures to prove that you are doing worse and worse the things this is the problem i have and this is this is what i believe it happened with our minister you know it's not a point i wish gisa said from the beginning in january that we can guarantee that these plans announced by the government cannot be put in place if we continue to be a european country a, a, a member of the european union the european legal framework does not allow such changes so what is going to happen either the minister will operate outside the law he will implement his policies by not respecting community and the law which is, means a serious attack on the on, on the state of law on the law on, on the on, on the rule of law uh, state or the minister will fail and then the neo nazis at the next election will say you see even this minister who said exactly what we said at the end of the day he didn't do anything so who is going to benefit from this situation of course at the end of the day at the far right the populists those they want to destabilize the society for their own benefits this is going to happen this is why we tell the politicians you attack us but at the end of the day you shoot your leg because this is what is going to happen if you don't protect the civil society organizations who work for democracy in this country at the end of the day you are not going to be able to defend democracy and you will see right thank you doro for your uh, extensive answer Sir? i should say uh, i would like to repeat the question uh, to ask uh, for the perspective and comment of martin because you are in greece how does the discourse war works in this case especially how it is a uh, intensified with the COVID-19 crisis. So any comment from your side, please, Martin? Uh, I didn't hear the question very well, but I'll try to answer what I thought I heard. Uh, I think the problem that we, is that we are missing uh, a discourse of what immigrants are in our societies. Uh, the Kafala system, for example, insists immigrants are temporary. I showed in my research 10 years ago that almost one third of the immigrants in one country, we didn't have data for others, had been there for more than 10 years. Now, in my, in my view, I think if you live in a country for more than 10 years, you have some sort of degree of settlement and permanence, you've somehow fitted in. If you live for more than 20 years, definitely, definitely. And uh, I think we have to have a political uh, discussion which is accepted by left and right that there is a mechanism by which people who wish to stay in a particular country for a long period of time are ultimately accepted. Even Saudi Arabia now accepts that people who live for more than 20 years should be able to become Saudi citizens. So I think, I think that is missing. It's a polarized left-right debate with the left emphasizing certain things, the right emphasizing, let's not talk about it, but we know what we're talking about. And I think there isn't a general debate about how we view immigrants because it's become so contentious i think that's part of the problem the capitalist system makes it worse but the problem is there in every european country as well so it, it's not only the capitalist system it is about global trends in politics that we have lost uh, the capacity to make reasoned arguments and everything is an ideological belief whether it's left right or whatever so that's my take on that if that helps and since you have uh, the microphone, could you please uh, say your concluding remarks? And because we need to conclude at some point, please. Martin. 
My conclusion is that we we have exposed with the coronavirus incident all the defects of the world. Uh, we've exposed all the um, injustices. We've exposed all of these problems. We've revealed that one or two governments managed it quite well. Astonishingly, the least competent seem to be the Anglophone uh, countries, which decided to do almost nothing at the beginning, then showed extreme lack of competence. But the reason, of course, is that these are predominantly rather right-wing uh, establishments which uh, prioritize money over people. Um, I think, again, that, that's part of the debate we need to have, uh, a debate on people rather than money, because the money debate has, has failed completely. We haven't even done well with that. We may as well turn back to people. And immigrants are a big part of the economic process. They are absolutely vital to every single country. Uh, in the Gulf countries, where they form as much as 90% of the workforce, they are absolutely And uh, it, it's astonishing that these countries carry on with such enormous proportions of immigration, and yet there, there, there is so little progress in, in human rights. But that's my conclusion. We need to focus on what we learned from the coronavirus and, and try and get some benefit out of it, even though it's quite difficult to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll transfer now to Doros for your, your concluding remarks, please, before we finish well, this interview. I, I, I will start with your favorite expression. I think the status quo cannot be maintained in relation to migration. <laughs> so it seems as if I think what, what yes, it, it's I, I borrow it from the from from the from the Cyprus problem. You can imagine that the, the current uh, status quo cannot be maintained. As the as the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the general director of the UN said to the two leaders, I would say that we we are at the situation where we need, despite the difficulties we have, we need to really, what is said, think how we can deal with a situation that is a phenomenon that we cannot. Ignore. We are going to have migrants. We are going to have refugees in in, in, in all the societies. Is not a phenomenon from yesterday. It's a phenomenon from the very beginning of the uh, uh, of, of of this humanity. Is a phenomenon that is going to accompany us and eventually is going to be more intensive in the in the future as well. And we need to find ways to offer uh, um, um, the structures and the space to the people to live together, uh, peaceful, to respect each other, and gain from their differences rather than feel threatened from their differences, whatever differences. I think we need to rethink this situation and we need to find the strength to give up the current policies that they are very much risk, uh, um, oriented on how we can restrict the rights of the people, how we can control the people, how we can, uh, which it doesn't work at the end of the day. It's what you say, I mean, you can, in Cyprus we said we are going to replace the people every four years. We have migrants, we have second generation, and nearly we are going to reach a third generation. And they, these people, they still have a visitor status in this country. Okay, hospitality in this country it was a very important uh, word, but such a hospitality that we have migrants for 20 years and they cannot become a, 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 a permanent and equal part of this society is a misunderstanding of this concept of hospitality, in my opinion. So we need to rethink this situation. We need to work together and we need to persuade our society to overcome their fears and see the positive elements of this coexistence and this cooperation. I think this is what is important to be done right now, and we need to uh, uh, work uh, along these lines despite the very, very difficult conditions we have currently. I would like now to thank you both for your participation and your contribution and for the lovely discussion. Martin Bortwood Edwards and Doros Poligarpu. I would very much love, love to thank George for being next to us and being the demon of the technical issues. And we had a lot of technical issues, believe me, today. 
and also George Kostandinidis that has been helping us a lot. Panayotis is, is getting ready for your show. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to the third installment of Meeting Points. I am George... Um, no, you are George Nicolaou. I am Oresis Tringidis. Thank you very much, mate, and for your lovely questions. That you helped a lot. So, gentlemen, and everyone who listened, thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Pamet Ragudaki, Gaspacho, Massive Illusions. Vámonos.